Uh, first of all, let me thank my friends at ADH for inviting me to this event. Um, I will give my presentation in English because I understood that this would be the working language of the weekend of Mark Fisher, um, which is very convenient insofar because that way I won't have to translate my direct quotes and uh, I'll give you a fair warning, there will be plenty of them. The title I've chosen is um, Mark Fisher and the Repoliticization of Mental Health, um, which is basically taken from uh, capitalist realism, where he famously states that um, the current ruling ontology denies any possibility of a social causation of mental illness. The chemical biologization of mental illness is, of course, strictly commensurate with its depoliticization. Considering mental illness an individual chemical biological problem has enormous benefits for capitalism. First, it reinforces capital's drive towards atomistic individualization. You're sick because of your brain chemistry. Second, it provides an enormously lucrative market in which multinational pharmaceutical companies can peddle their pharmaceuticals, can peddle their pharmaceuticals. It goes without saying that all mental illnesses are neurologically instantiated, but this says nothing about their causation. If it is true, for instance, that depression is constituted by low serotonin levels, what still needs to be explained is why particular individuals have low levels of serotonin. This requires a social and political explanation and the task of repoliticizing the mental, uh, sorry, the task of repoliticizing mental illness is an urgent one if the left wants to challenge capitalist realism. So after some consideration, um, I've chosen to disappoint the viewers right away uh, because actually a lot of what I will be talking about is how not to politicize mental health. That mental health has been a pressing issue for a while now hardly needs mentioning. Just let it be known that the WHO has named the depression quite unsentimentally one of the health issues which was expected to have some of the worst economic impact even some years ago. So that is before, even before the pandemic and the lockdowns and the whole discussions about um, mental illnesses, depression um, in that context. And indeed, there is no shortage of discourse on mental health issues, be it on social media or legacy media, some of which uh, will be addressed in the following. So um, the task I've given myself was one of an expository character and that turned out to be harder than I initially expected uh, because as anyone who is even vaguely familiar with Mark Fisher's writing knows, it was highly fragmentary and rhizomatic uh, owing to his preferred form, which was the blog post. So the procedure I eventually, eventually chose was uh, starting with a tour through one of said blog posts, which is published in the K-Punk collection by Repeater Books. Um, so this this tome right here, this is what it this is what it looks like when you print out a blog. Um, the title of uh, of the blog post is Anti Therapy, and I think it fits the purpose here best. And I will just uh, see where that leads. So anti-therapy begins um, with the following passage. The idea that talking about our feelings could be a political act seems counterintuitive. Aren't people talking about their emotions more than ever before? And hasn't this new emotionalism coincided with the emergence of what I have called capitalist realism? the deeply embedded view that capitalism is the only quote unquote realistic 
economic system. And in the following, uh, Fisher elaborates the idea that the abandonment of class politics under post-Fordism was accompanied, if not reinforced, by what he calls emo politics. So for the UK, he gives a, a precise moment when this nexus uh, became tangible. And that moment was the Tony Blair's speech on the occasion of the death of Princess Diana. Prime Minister, can we please have your reaction to the news? I feel like everyone else in this country today, utterly devastated. Our thoughts and prayers are with Princess Diana's family, in particular her two sons, the two boys. Our hearts go out to them. We are today a nation in Britain in a state of shock, in mourning, in grief that is so deeply painful for us. She was a wonderful and a warm human being. Though her own life was often sadly touched by tragedy, she touched the lives of so many others in Britain throughout the world with joy and with comfort. How many times shall we remember her in how many different ways? with the sick, the dying, with children, with the needy, when with just a look or a gesture that spoke so much more than words, she would reveal to all of us the depth of her compassion and her humanity. You know how, how difficult things were for her from time to time I'm sure we can only guess at, but the people everywhere, not just here in Britain, everywhere, they kept faith with Princess Diana. They liked her, they loved her. They regarded her as one of the people. She was the people's princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain in our hearts and in our memories, forever. <laughs> now, what's wrong with this display of grief? Uh, according to Fisher, in the wake of the death of Diana and the reactions to it, a strong, and I quote, a strong narrative uh, e soon emerged in which Blair's apparent emotional openness was contrasted with the Queen's coldness. The monarch's remoteness was now equated with quote unquote unhealthy forms of emotional repression. Just as Blair sold himself as a modernizer, who was taking the Labour Party away from the class politics of the past, so new Labour would also make a break with the traditional accounts, uh, account of emotions. The government would now take the lead in ensuring that the population had the quote-unquote correct, quote-unquote healthy response to emotional distress. So why is this, why is this bad news? What's wrong with healthy responses to emotional distress? Isn't repression the problem? Um, almost two decades before the death of Princess Diana, the historian and cultural critic Christopher Lash in The Culture of Narcissism already called mental health, and I quote, the modern equivalent of salvation. End of quote. In the chapter, The Therapeutic Sensibility, he writes 
sublimations strike the therapeutic sensibility as intolerably oppressive, offensive to common sense and injurious to personal health and well-being. In a society which, quote, has no future, unquote, and therefore gives no thought to anything beyond its immediate needs. And a little further down, to liberate humanity from such outmoded ideas of love and duty has become the mission of the post-Freudian therapies and particularly of their converts and popularizers, for whom mental health means the overthrow of inhibitions and the immediate gratification of every impulse." End of quote. Um, so what Christopher Lash aims here in this early chapter of the culture of narcissism, prefiguring many of uh, Fisher's themes, is the displacement of politics by a therapeutic jargon and ideology and a certain privatism uh, which to him, of course, uh, must be distinguished from genuine privacy. So in anti-therapy, Fisher describes this relationship as follows, and I quote, On the one hand, the working class subject was interpolated by new labor as being capable of radical, indeed practically infinite self-transformation. One of the most significant effects of this ideology, which was at one and the same time its presupposition, was the divesting of the subject of its class position. Class identity, identity in, in scare quotes, um, was perceived as both an atavism and a constraint, holding the subject back from the infinite promises of self-reinvention. On the other hand, as soon as something went wrong, and the behavior of working class individuals inevitably went outside the parameters policed by the myriad of surveillance and control agencies, which the new labor administration invented, they were seen as fundamentally lacking in self-determination and the capacity for self-care and were subject to intensive disciplining. So for Fisher, emo politics uh, with its rhetoric of mental health personal growth, self-transformation, etc., etc., was and is as much a promise as it was and is a threat. Not only is it coupled with a certain disenfranchisement, say from traditional collective resources like labor unions and the like, what's more, um, quote, therapeutic narratives of self-transformation feed into what Fisher calls negative solidarity. Uh, and negative solidarity is the tendency for neoliberal subjects to race to the bottom. If others are, Fisher writes, if others are perceived to be in receipt of resources or benefits that they, quote, haven't earned, unquote, they should not only be denied those resources, they should be publicly shamed for claiming them. Everyone should, quote, stand on their own feet, end of quote. So to cut it brutally short in this emo political regime that Fisher describes, you're very much allowed to care about yourself, about your emotions. You're very much allowed to talk about them. But it is also your responsibility and almost your responsibility alone to do so. So the problem, and again, I quote Fisher, is not that it, so this regime, it's not that it posits subjects as vulnerable, as haunted by events in their past lives, as lacking in confidence, because most subjects in capitalism, including those in the ruling class, fit that description. The problem with the therapeutic imaginary, which is another term he introduces in this post, is it's claimed that these issues can be solved by the individual subject working on him or herself with only the therapist to assist them. The first antinomy of the therapeutic imaginary, according to Fisher, is the idea 
that the proliferation of therapeutic orthodoxies simultaneously produces quote-unquote softened subjects, the, that is subjects who you know, identify as lacking, if not actually damaged, and subjects that are quote-unquote hardened, subjects who pride themselves on a claimed invulnerability. And indeed, uh, you can often find both attributes at the same time. <clears throat> in a recent article in Der Spiegel, which is titled, What We Can Learn From Depressives, you can, find, you can find praise of depressives, and the author herself even identifies as a survivor of depression. Yet how the issue is framed is quite remarkable, because what is said is essentially that some depressives learn by way of acknowledging their condition to lower their standards in order to alleviate some of the pressure. For example, uh, you know, you don't have to wash your hair every day, your room doesn't have to be tidy, and so on and so on. So whatever little depressives do achieve during an episode is something to be proud of. And the same goes for almost everyone during a pandemic, the, the, uh, the author argues. So um, there's a strange reversal from an appreciation of vulnerability to almost the opposite. An appreciation of what in contemporary psychological discourse has become widely um, known as resilience which is the ability to, to again, to, to cut this really short, the ability precisely to keep functioning under extreme hardship. And that, make no mistake, is expected uh, from anybody, whether they're, whether they're uh, depressed or not. And in that view, some depressives show very useful techniques of emotional self-regulation that can be put to use uh, for the population at large, especially in times of crisis. In a different essay, also published in the Capon collection called The Privatization of Stress, Fisher observed that depression and the condition of capitalist realism had a causal relation. Neoliberal precarity offers no deeper level of comfort or stability and rather requires constant adaptation and vigilance to monitor change and flux. Um, Fisher writes, one difference between sadness and depression is that while sadness apprehends itself as a contingent and temporary state of affairs, depression presents itself as necessary and interminable. The glacial surfaces of the depressive world extend to every conceivable horizon. In the depths of the condition, the depressive does not experience his or her melancholia as pathological or indeed abnormal. The conviction of depression that agency is useless, that beneath the appearance of virtue lies only venality, strikes sufferers as a truth which they have reached, but others are too deluded to grasp. There's clearly a relationship between the seeming quote unquote realism of the depressive with its radically lowered expectations and capitalist realism, end of quote. And in, a, in another blog post published in K-Punk, Fisher writes something in a similar vein, capitalist realism can be described as the belief that there is no alternative to capitalism. However, it is more usually manifest not in grand claims about political economy, but in more banal behaviors and expectations, such as a weary acceptance that pay and conditions will stagnate or deteriorate. So again, um, lowered expectations is arguably something that large parts of the population will somehow have to deal with, not only since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, hence the general usefulness of the emotional self-regulation technique, techniques I just briefly mentioned. 
So in a way, uh, the recommendations uh, the article gives are a way to uh, cut off your nose to, to spite the face, so to say. So while it's certainly in the short term reasonable to lower one's expectations of oneself when having a depressive episode, at the same time, in the broader sense, lowered expectations are precisely what fuels depression as understood by Fisher. All right. Um, so the second antinomy of the therapeutic imaginary Fisher describes, I will just very briefly address. It's an, quote, excessive tendency among many subjects today to identify as victims of abuse. Moralizing aggression and investment and impotence has, he argues, proliferated in a political atmosphere now substantially shaped by the online environment, end of quote. So this is an argument he also explores elsewhere, um, for example, uh, in Exiting the Vampire Castle, and others like Angel and Nagel, for example, um, have followed him. Um, so what what makes this antinom antin what makes this an antin antinomy for him is the increased awareness of actual abuse by people in power. So, but yet for Fisher, these two halves still don't quite fit together in his view. But uh, instead of following this thread, I want to return to the first description of the therapeutic imaginary, that is the individual subject. Um, maybe with assistance by a therapist or not, that has to work on him or herself. So, and this is um, where a crucial inspiration for Fisher's thinking about mental health enters. The British clinical psychologist David Smale, who was a proponent of a social materialist explanation of psychological distress. And I quote from a quote again from The Privatization of Stress. Smale argues that Margaret Thatcher's view that there is no such thing as society, only individuals and their families, finds an, quote, unacknowledged echo in almost all approaches to therapy, end of quote. That's a quote by Smale. Therapies such as cognitive behavioral therapy combine a focus on early life, a kind of psychoanalysis light with the self-help doctrine that individuals can become masters of their own destiny. Smale gives the immensely suggestive name magical voluntarism to the view that, quote, with the expert help of your therapist or counselor, you can change the world you are, uh, you can change the world you are in. Sorry. You can change the world you are in the last analysis responsible for so that it no longer costs you distress. End of quote. If one's going to think about what one does about the uh, really widespread incidence of, of psychological and emotional distress of all kinds in our society, one's, we've got really to stop thinking um, of it in terms of the individual's problem, some form of illness or weakness uh, inside the person, and begin to think much more carefully about the kind of, of society in which people are located, because that's where the damage is done. really a, a political question which is a matter for everyone to address themselves to, to think about what kind of a society you want, what kind of relations to people, between people do you want to encourage, and so on. <laughs> 
that's very hard to envisage that happening. It's, I think, especially hard to envisage that happening at the moment because we seem to be bent on a very uh, privatizing course, one which, which, um, in which we don't want to think about the issue of how people live publicly, so to speak, together. Pe what people are concentrated on is, is personal feelings, private feelings, private gain, uh, personal satisfactions, personal relationships. All our effort goes into thinking about how you maximize those kinds of uh, um, advantages and so on. I think the issue then becomes one of, of turning away from that kind of uh, lust for, for personal satisfactions and gains and thinking about recreating a kind of public space in which people can live and, the, and one which is uh, beneficial rather than harmful, essentially. What people who suffer psychological distress tend to become aware of is that no matter how much they want to change, no matter how hard they try, no matter what mental gymnastics they put themselves through, their experiences of life stay much the same. This is because there's no such thing as an autonomous individual. What powers we have are acquired from and distributed within our social context. Some of them, the most powerful at unreachable distances from us. The very meaning of our actions is not something that we can autonomously determine but it's made intelligible or otherwise by orders of culture over which we have virtually no control. So I hope this tour through emo politics and the therapeutic imaginary was not too demoralizing. Uh, and still the question remains, when can talking about our feelings become a political act? How can we imagine a truly political form of addressing mental health? And Fisher's answer is, and I quote, when it is part of a practice of consciousness raising that makes visible the impersonal and intersubjective structures that ideology normally obscures from us. And in yet another blog post named Abandoned Hope, Fisher gives his uh, definition, uh, gives this definition of consciousness raising. Consciousness raising is about positive depersonalization. It's not your fault, it's capitalism. No individuals can change anything, not even themselves. But collective act activation is already imminently overcoming individualized immiseration. So if you have paid attention, this is pretty much the antithesis to the therapeutic imaginary that I just described. So um, for Fisher, just as for Smale, the question of mental health was intimately tied up with forms of collectivity or rather lack thereof. Uh, and ultimately also with Fisher's understanding of Derrida's notion of ontology. And as a communism, which um, as many of you will know, uh, remained a fragment, Fisher writes, the installation of capitalist realism was by no means a simple restoration of an old state of affairs. The mandatory individualism imposed by neoliberalism was a new form of individualism, an individualism defined against the different forms of collectivity that clamored out of the 60s. This new individualism was designed to both surpass and make us forget those collective forms. So to recall these multiple forms of collectivity is less an act of remembering than of unforgetting, a counter exorcism of the specter of a world which could be free. And again, in the privatization of stress, what we urgently need is a politics of mental health organized around the problem of public space. In its break from the old Stalinist left, the various new lefts wanted a de-bureaucratized public space and worker autonomy. 
but what they got was managerialism and shopping. What we need to revive is not social formations that failed and failed for reasons that progressives should be pleased about, but a political project that never really happened, the achievement of a democratic public sphere. Um, Fisher called this entire project um, a leftist modernism. And what this would concretely entail is certainly up to debate. And Fisher gives, you know, uh, presents some elements um, in, you know, in, in um, what's the name? I keep forgetting the names. 